This is Ray Moss Holder with the day in history, December 21st. The Spaniards who conquered the Caribbean and operated plantations with Native American Indian labor were merciless in their destruction of the Indians and perpetrated terrible cruelties to get gold or to revenge slight wrongs. Most priests were silent to these abuses, but a few Dominicans were outraged, and one of them, Antonio de Montesinos, entered a pulpit in Hispaniola on this day, the 21st of December, 1511, to warn his listeners of their spiritual peril. The hardened men rejected his words and demanded a retraction. However, the Dominican prior, Pedro de Cordoba, followed Maracina's sermon with a threat of excommunication for all in Quimadero's plantation owners who did not free their Indians. Now, here is a part of Maracina's sermon. I have climbed to this pulpit to let you know of your sins for i am the voice of christ crying in the desert of this island and therefore you must not listen to me indifferently but with all your heart and all your senses this voice tells you that you are in mortal sin that you not only are in it but live in it and die in it and this because of the cruelty and tyranny that you bring to bear on these innocent people. Tell me, by what right of justice do you hold these Indians in such a cruel and horrible servitude? On what authority have you waged such detestable wars against these people who dealt quietly and peacefully on their own lands? Wars in which you have destroyed such an infinite number of them by homicides and slaughters, never heard of before. Why do you keep them so oppressed and exhausted without giving them enough to eat or curing them of their sicknesses that they incur from the excessive labor you give them and they die? Or rather, you kill them in order to extract and acquire gold every day. Are they not human? Have they no souls? Are you not required to love them as you love yourselves? How can you remain in such profound moral lethargy? I assure you, in your present state, you can no more be saved than Moors or Turks, who do not have and even reject the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, the sermon outraged the conquistadors, including Admiral Diego Columbus, who was the son of Christopher Columbus, and other representatives of King Ferdinand II. Directly after the protests of the friars at Santo Domingo, came an order from King Ferdinand II that Montesinos and other Dominicans who supported him were to be shipped back to Spain. Ferdinand began by referring to the preaching of Montesinos as a, quote, novel and groundless attitude, end quote, and a, quote, dangerous opinion that would do much harm to all the affairs of the, that land, end quote. But after returning to Spain, Montesinos and his companions were able to persuade the king of the righteousness of their position. As a result, the king convened a commission that rewrote the laws of Burgos, the first code of ordinances to protect the indigenous people, regulate their treatment and conversion, and limit the demands 
of the Spanish colonizers upon them. S 1790, December 21st, Samuel Slater opened the first cotton mill in the United States, in Rhode Island. One thing you're going to be missing a lot if you don't come and join me here at reachmornout.com is the pictures that go with the stories. You'll want to see those again, reachmornout.com and take a look at right underneath the video. 1862, December 21st, the U.S. Congress authorized the Medal of Honor to be awarded to Navy personnel who have distinguished themselves by their gallantry in action. Now, determined to challenge the growing American military presence in their territory, Indians in northern Wyoming lured Lieutenant Colonel William Fetterman and his soldiers into a deadly ambush on this day in 1866. Tensions in the region started rising in 1863 when John Bozeman blazed the Bozeman Trail, a new route for immigrants traveling to the Montana gold fields. The Bozeman's trail was of questionable legality since it passed directly through hunting grounds that the government had promised to the Sioux. Cheyenne and Arapaho in the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. So when Colorado militiamen murdered more than 200 peaceful Cheyenne during the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864, the Indians began to take revenge by attacking whites all across the plains, including the immigrants traveling the Bozeman Trail. The U.S. government responded by building a series of protective forts along the trail. The largest and most important of these was Fort Phil Kearney, erected in 1866 in north-central Wyoming. Indians under the leadership of Red Cloud and Crazy Horse began to focus their attacks on Fort Phil Kearney, constantly harassing the soldiers and raiding their woods and supply parties. On December 6th, 1866, Crazy Horse discovered to his surprise that he could lead a small detachment of soldiers into a fatal ambush by dismounting from his horse and fleeing as if he were defenseless. Struck by the foolish impulsiveness of the soldiers, Crazy Horse and Red Cloud reasoned that perhaps a much larger force could be lured into a similar deadly trap. Now, on the bitterly cold morning of December 21st, about 2,000 Indians concealed themselves along the road just north of Fort Phil Kearney. A small band made a diversionary attack on a party of woodcutters from the fort, and Commandant Colonel Henry Carrington quickly ordered Colonel Fetterman to go to their aid with a company of 80 troopers. Crazy Horse and 10 decoy warriors then rode into view of the fort. When Carrington fired an artillery round at them, the decoys ran away as if frightened. The party of woodcutters made it safely back to the fort, but Colonel Fetterman and his men chased after the fleeing crazy horse and his decoys just as planned. And the soldiers rode straight into the ambush and were wiped out in a massive attack during which some 40,000 arrows rained down on the hapless troopers. Not one of them survived. With 81 fatalities, the Fetterman Massacre was the Army's worst defeat in the West until the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. 
Further Indian attacks eventually forced the army to reconsider its commitment to protecting the Bozeman Trail. And in 1868, the military abandoned the forts and pulled out. It was one of only a small handful of clear Indian victories in the Plains Indian Wars. December 21st, 1910, 2.5 million, now try to grasp that number, 2.5 million plague victims were reported in the Anhu province of China. 1910, President Calvin Coolidge signed the Boulder Dam Authorization Bill. The dam was to be built in Nevada, which it is. The dam was given a new name by President Herbert Hoover, the Hoover Dam. <laughs> Both names are used to this day. On this day in 1918, the 26-year-old collegiate and amateur ice hockey star Hobie Baker was killed in a plane crash in Toul, France, just after the end of World War I. After beginning his hockey career at St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire, Baker played four seasons of hockey at Princeton University in New Jersey, leading his team to two intercollegiate championships in 1912 and 1914. A, quote, rover on the Princeton team, Baker was known for his ability to cover the rink from end to end and score from various positions. He was also captain of the football team, which won a national championship in 1911. After graduating from Princeton, Baker worked for the J.P. Morgan Investment Bank and played amateur hockey for the St. Nicholas Club of New York City. Upon America's entry into World War I in 1917, Baker enlisted in the U.S. Army as a pilot. He flew in the famous Lafayette Escadrille, an elite squadron of the French Air Force, and participated in air battles against such German aces as Manfred von Richthofen, or the Red Baron, as he's better known. During his service for the Allies, Baker painted his plane in orange and black the colors of his beloved Princeton Tigers, and was awarded the Croix de Guerre for his superior conduct under fire. Tragically, he died in a flying accident barely a month after the armistice while test flying one of his squadron's planes. In 1945, Baker became one of the inaugural inductees into the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. The Hobie Baker Memorial Award is presented annually to the best college hockey player in the country. It's the equivalent of college football's famed Heisman Trophy. On December 21st, 1945, General George S. Patton, commander of the U.S. Third Army, died from injuries suffered not in battle, but in a freak car accident. He was 60 years old. Descended from a long line of military men, Patton graduated from the West Point Military Academy in 1909. He represented the United States in the 1912 Olympics as the first American participant in the pentathlon. He did not win a medal. He went on to serve in the tank corps during World War I, an experience that made Patton a dedicated proponent of tank warfare. During World War II, as commander of the U.S. 7th Army, he captured Palermo, Sicily in 1943 by using tanks. Patton's audacity became evident in 1944 
when during the Battle of the Bulge, he employed an unorthodox strategy that involved the 90 degree pivoting move of his third army forces, enabling him to speedily relieve the besieged allied defenders of Bastogne, Belgium. Along the way, Patton's mouth proved as dangerous to his career as the Germans. When he berated and slapped a hospitalized soldier, diagnosed with shell shock, but whom Patton accused of malingering, the press turned on him and pressure was applied to cut him down to size. He might have found himself enjoying early retirement had not General Dwight D. Eisenhower and General George Marshall intervened on his behalf. And after several months of inactivity, he was back to work. And work he did at the Battle of the Bulge, during which Bat Patton once again succeeded in employing a complex and quick-witted strategy, turning the German thrust into Bastogne into an Allied counter-thrust, driving the Germans east across the Rhine. In March 1945, Patton's army swept through southern Germany into, Yugosla into Czechoslovakia, sorry, Yugoslavia, <laughs> Czechoslovakia, which he was stopped from capturing by the Allies out of respect for the Soviets' post-war political plans for Eastern Europe. Patton had many gifts, but diplomacy was not one of them. After the war, while stationed in Germany, he criticized the process of denazification, the removal of former Nazi party members from positions of political, administrative, and governmental power. His impolitic press statements questioning the policy caused Eisenhower to remove him as U.S. commander in Bavaria. He was transferred to the 15th Army Group, but in December of 1945, he suffered a broken neck in a car accident and died less than two weeks later. For the full story surrounding the death of George S. Patton, read Bill O'Reilly's book, The Killing of Patton. On December 21st, 1946, an earthquake and tidal wave killed hundreds of people in Japan. On December 21st, 1964, England abolished the death penalty. Now on this day in 1970, rock star Elvis Presley was greeted at the White House by President Richard M. Nixon. Presley's visit was not just a social call. He wanted to meet Nixon in order to offer his services in the government's war on drugs. Three weeks earlier, Presley wanted to distance himself from rock and roll's unseemly association with drug use and counterculture, had met Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, in Palm Springs, California, and offered to use his celebrity status to help promote the administration's anti-drug campaign. Presley then flew to Washington, checking into a hotel under an alias on December 20th. In the next day, he and two of his bodyguards proceeded to the White House gates, where Presley handed the guard a handwritten letter. And in the letter, Presley told Nixon he did not associate or agree with the, quote, drug culture hippie elements, end quote, student protesters and, quote, Black Panthers, whom he believed hated America. He declared that he wanted nothing but to, quote, help the country out end quote, and asked to be designated, quote, a federal agent at large. And the guard immediately recognized Presley, but 
followed protocol and asked for permission to send him on to the White House. He apparently was not searched before being granted admission. Upon meeting Nixon, he presented the president with a gift, a World War II-era Colt 45 pistol. The two were photographed shaking hands, and Nixon in a conservative suit and tie, and Elvis wearing tight purple velvet pants and an open-collared shirt with jewel chains, a purple velvet cape slung over his shoulders, and an enormous belt buckle. Nixon and, quote, the king exchanged pleasantries and agreed that those who use drugs are in the vanguard of American protest. Presley again reiterated his desire to do whatever he could to help influence young people and fellow musicians to reject drugs and anti-Americanism. And at the conclusion of the brief meeting, Presley surprised Nixon with a hug. On December 31st, Richard Nixon wrote a thank you note to Presley for the gift of the pistol and for visiting him at the White House. He said nothing at all about enlisting Presley's aid in the war on drugs. The administration's ambivalence I have to stop just for it's the president, I know. Hello, uh, yes, President Obama, uh, I will, good President Obama, I will be, um, I, I will, I, I, I'm still for Trump, I'm sorry, bye-bye. <laughs> uh, we're here. Yes, I'll always be here for you. Boy, the president. Huh. Once been a, I, I, I didn't know I didn't endorse Trump. I just said I was for him because I I didn't want to continue the call. Now here we go again. Um when Nixon wrote Presley back, he said nothing about enlisting Presley's aid in the war on drugs. The administration's ambivalence about the idea was illustrated in his aide's correspondence at the time. In an inner office White House memo dashed off the morning of December 21st, the day of Presley's impromptu White House visit, Nixon's aide Dwight Chapin suggested that Elvis not be quote, pushed off on the vice president, end quote, but be introduced directly to Nixon. And he further noted that if Nixon wanted to meet bright young people outside the government, Presley might be the one to start with. A.H.R. Haldeman responded, you must be kidding. In the end, Nixon never offered Elvis an official position in his administration's war on drugs. Now, Presley died from heart failure in 1977, which the coroner's report said was due to undetermined causes. Speculation abounded, however, that his death was caused by a lethal mix of a variety of prescription drugs and obesity. The Defense Department announced that eight B-52 bombers and several fighter bombers were lost since the commencement of Operation Linebacker II on December 18th, 1972. Now, these losses included at least 43 flyers captured or killed. And President Richard Nixon ordered the operation after the North Vietnamese negotiators walked out of the peace talks in Paris. 
In response, President Nixon immediately issued an ultimatum that North Vietnam send its representatives back to the conference table within 72 hours or else. When they rejected Nixon's demand, he ordered a full-scale air campaign against Hanoi and Haiphong to force them back to the negotiating table. On December 28th, after 11 days of intensive bombing and a lot of loss, the North Vietnamese agreed to return to the talks. Now, do these words sound familiar? And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man on the moon, when you coming home, dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. You recognize those words? They're from Cat and the Cradle. Harry Chapin earned a reputation as a politically conscious singer-songwriter who dedicated himself in the years before his untimely death to various noble causes, including wiping out world hunger. Indeed, his greatest legacy may stem more from his charitable efforts than from his music in itself, except for a brief period in the early 1970s. Harry Chapin was a legitimate pop star. On December 21st, 1974, he earned his one and only number one pop hit when his bittersweet story song, Cats in the Cradle, reached the top of the Billboard Hot 100. The top. I love this song. Before turning his attention to music, at the relatively advanced age of 29, Harry Chapin pursued a career as a film director and earned an Oscar nomination for his 1968 boxing documentary, Legendary Champions. In 1971, he recruited a backing band via an ad in the Village Voice and recorded his first album. And released in 1972, Heads and Tails included what many fans regard as Chapin's signature song, Taxi, a lushly produced six minute plus story song about a San Francisco cab driver and a long lost love that he picked up as a fare. Despite its length, Taxi became a hit, reaching number 24 on the Billboard pop chart in the spring of 1972. Chapin's second and third albums were nowhere near as successful as his first, and he'd turned his full-time attention to writing a Broadway show when his fourth album, Verities and Balderdash, unexpectedly became a smash hit on the strength of that one song, Cats in the Cradle, a tale of an absent father and an endless cycle of intergenerational dysfunction based on a poem written by Chapin's wife. Cats in the Cradle was Chapin's last big hit. And though he retained a loyal fan base through the remainder of the 1970s, his work as a social activist during that period was far more significant than his work as a musician. Chapin is widely credited with spurring the creation of the President's Commission on World Hunger in 1977, and he shares indirect responsibility for one of the biggest music charity efforts of all time, USA for Africa, which was organized by Chapin's former manager, Ken Cregan. On the occasion of Chapin's posthumous award of the Congressional Gold Medal in 1987, Cregan, who also organized Hands Across America, credited Chapin as his inspiration. Quote, 
all of our efforts with hunger and homeliness, homelessness, not homeliness, all of our efforts with <laughs> All of our efforts with hunger and homelessness began with Harry. Born December 7th, 1942 in New York City, singer, songwriter Harry Chapin was killed in an auto accident on the Long Island Expressway on July 16th, 1981. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know, we'll have a good time then. I hope all dads are hearing that and understanding what it means. On December 21st, 1975, in Vienna, Austria, Carlos the Jekyll led a raid on a meeting of oil ministers from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, the OPEC. German and Arab terrorists stormed in with machine guns, killed three people, and took 63 people hostage, including 11 OPEC ministers calling his group the, quote, arm of the Arab revolution, end quote, Cullis demanded that an anti-Israeli political statement be broadcast over radio and that a bus and jet be provided for the terrorists and their hostages. Austrian authorities complied and all the hostages were released in Algeria unharmed. OPEC did not hold another summit for 25 years. In 1949, Ilyich Ramirez Sanchez was born the son of a millionaire Marxist lawyer in Caracas, Venezuela, and attended Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, where he became involved with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine during the 1970s and early 1980s, he acted as a freelance terrorist for various Arab groups and is suspected to have killed as many as 80 people in a chain of bombings, hijackings, and assassinations. Nearly apprehended on several occasions, Carlos the Jackal managed to evade international authorities until 1994, when French agents captured him hiding in the Sudan. Secretly extradited to France, he was sent to a French prison where he lived for three years before being put on trial in 1997 for the 1975 Paris murders of two French counterintelligence officers and a pro-Palestinian Lebanese who had turned informant. On December 23rd, 1997, a French jury found Sanchez guilty and sentenced him to life in prison. December 21st, 1986, 500,000 Chinese students gathered in Shanghai's People's Square calling for democratic reforms, including freedom of the press, and a lot of good it did them. On this day in 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 from London to New York exploded in midair over Lockerbie, Scotland, an hour after departure. The blast killed all 243 passengers and 16 crew members aboard. It also killed 11 residents of Lockerbie who were struck by a harsh shower of airplane parts that fell from the sky. A bomb that had been hidden inside an audio cassette player detonated inside the cargo area when the plane was at an altitude 
of 31,000 feet. The disaster, which became the subject of Britain's largest criminal investigation, was believed to be an attack against the United States. 189 of the victims were American. Authorities accused Islamic terrorists of having placed the bomb on the plane at the low security airport in Malta. The bomb was transferred to Flight 103 in Frankfurt, Germany. Terrorists were accused of planting the bomb on the plane while it was at the airport in Frankfurt. Authorities suspected the attack was in retaliation for either the 1986 U.S. airstrikes against Libya, in which Muammar Gaddafi's young daughter was killed, along with dozens of other people, or a 1988 incident in which the U.S. mistakenly shot down an Iran air commercial flight over the Persian Gulf, killing 290 people, or it might have been for both. Now, 16 days before the explosion over Lockerbie, the U.S. Embassy in Helsinki, Finland, received a call warning that a bomb would be placed on a Pan Am flight out of Frankfurt. There's controversy over how seriously the United States took that threat and whether travelers should have been alerted. But officials later said that the connection between the call and the bomb was coincidental. In 1991, following a joint investigation by the British authorities and the FBI, Libyan intelligence agents Abdul Bassett Ali al Magri and Lehman Khalifa Fima were indicted for murder. However, Libya refused to hand over the suspects to the U.S. And finally, in 1999, in an effort to ease United Nations sanctions against his country, Gaddafi agreed to turn over the two men in Scotland for trial in the Netherlands using Scottish law and prosecutors. In early 2001, Al Magri was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, and FEMA was acquitted. Over the U.S. government's objections, Al Magri was freed and returned to Libya in August 2009 after doctors determined that he had only months to live. In 2003, Libya accepted responsibility for the bombing, but didn't express any remorse. The U.N. and U.S. lifted sanctions against Libya, and Libya agreed to pay each victim's family approximately $8 million in restitution. In 2004, Libya's prime minister said that the deal was the, quote, price for peace, end quote, implying that his country only took responsibility to get the sanctions lifted, a statement that infuriated the victims' families. Libya's prime minister said that the deal was the price for peace, implying that his country only accepted responsibility to release the sanctions. And uh, he also said Libya had not really accepted guilt for bombing. Nevertheless, Pan Am Airlines, which went bankrupt three years after the bombing, sued Libya and later received a $30 million settlement. 1995, December 21st, Israel surrendered Bethlehem to Palestine. There's a very beautiful picture of what Bethlehem looks like today in this news story on richmorenow.com. And we have not posted this yet because I'm not finished doing the stories yet. But when I do, I will quickly get this posted. On December 
21st, 2004, a suicide bomber attacked the forward operating base next to the United States military airfield at Mosul, Iraq, killing 22 people. It was the deadliest suicide attack on United States soldiers until this moment in the Iraqi war. Now, two stories begin our day, Monday, December 21st, 2015. Las Vegas police say that a woman intentionally drove her car onto a crowded strip sidewalk multiple times Sunday night, killing at least one person and injuring 37 others, six of them critically. Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Lieutenant Dan McGrath said the woman is in her 20s. Her name has not been released publicly. And uh, this is the quote. She went up and off these streets two or possibly three times. The woman is being interviewed and is having her blood drawn for a sobriety test. She is being held in the Clark County Jail with charges pending. The incident occurred at around 6.40 p.m. Las Vegas time. The woman's car, a 1996 Oldsmobile, was in the northbound lanes of Las Vegas Boulevard near Bellagio Way when it drove up onto the sidewalk in front of the Paris Hotel and Casino and struck pedestrians at a speed of 30 to 40 miles an hour. Police confirmed the person killed was an adult. Despite the apparently deliberate nature of the crash, police deputy chief Brett Zimmerman quickly said authorities know that this was not an act of terrorism. That's a direct quote. The incident took place in one of the busiest areas of the strip, across from the famous dancing water fountains of the Bellagio Hotel Casino. The driver was taken into custody. A three-year-old child was in the vehicle with her, but was not hurt. And then there's this second story. A grandson of former President Jimmy Carter died suddenly at a Georgia hospital early Sunday. The 39th president confirmed the family tragedy at the same Sunday school class where two weeks earlier he announced the happy news that there were no signs of the cancer that had recently been discovered on his brain and in his liver. And Carter said that Jeremy Carter, 28, wasn't feeling well Saturday afternoon and went to lie down at his parents' home. And Carter added that when Jeremy's mother went to check on him, the young man's heart had stopped. Jimmy Carter said another family member performed CPR on Jeremy Carter, but was unsuccessful. He said, quote, he was just 28 and a very wonderful young man who we loved very much. No cause of death for the younger Carter. Uh, was given. Well, that's the news for the 21st of December throughout history. And uh, I'm just getting started because there's more to come. Just remember those pictures that are available only on reachmorenow.com. And then also remember to go on over to Reach More Now YouTube and hit subscribe. Please do this. It would mean so much to me. Thank you.